everyone! Welcome to part one of chapter eight. Chapter eight is all about gases. Today, we are going to discuss some of the general properties of gases, and we're going to learn how to model them using some kind of simple gas laws. So let's go ahead and get going. All right, so like I said, this chapter is all about gases. We've talked about gases a little bit already, so let's review what we know. So gases are substances whose molecules are not in contact with one another. Remember, solids have particles that are really close together, and liquids also have particles that are really close together, but not held quite as strongly together as those in a solid, right? But in a gas, we have those molecules or atoms being really far apart. We've completely broken any intermolecular forces that are attracting them to each other, and they're kind of floating around by themselves. So they're separated by really large distances. So the reason we study gases in chemistry is because they're applicable to our daily lives. We are surrounded by gases all the time, like oxygen. Oxygen's in the air that we breathe. There's also nitrogen. Right? Um, you may also be familiar with things like helium from helium balloons. And we also have some nonmetal oxides that we encounter commonly, like carbon dioxide is in our uh, atmosphere and we also breathe it out. And there's also sometimes carbon monoxide, right? And some other gases. All right, so whenever we talk about gases, we are going to discuss their behavior with respect to kinetic molecular theory. And kinetic molecular theory, or KMT, as we abbreviate it, is just used to b explain this behavior of gases, okay? And we're always going to explain their behavior based on the motion of the particles, okay? So here's our first assumption. So our first assumption is that a gas is composed of molecules that are separated by really large distances. That's what we were talking about earlier. The distances between those atoms are extremely large, especially in comparison to their very, very, very small size of the atoms and molecules that make up those gases. Because they're separated by such large distances, that means gases are compressible. So like in this picture down here, we could squish this piston down, right? And we could make our gas more compact. So that's what I mean by compressible. You may be familiar with compressed air. Maybe if you've gone, I don't know, paintballing and you had, you know, a CO2 cylinder. Or if you were blowing up some balloons for a party and you had a canister of helium. Both of those gases are compressed. And so when you kind of open them up, they release the gases. And those gases are able to spread out even more. Alrighty, let's continue on with some more assumptions of kinetic molecular theory. So the next one is that gas molecules are in constant random motion. Remember, we learned about this temperature called zero Kelvin in which the motion of all molecules would stop. Since we're at a temperature above zero Kelvin, that means our molecules are in motion. Our molecules of a gas are moving faster than those of a solid and a liquid. So these are definitely in motion. And they say random because they're not being attracted to each other at all because we overcame those intermolecular forces that were holding them together. So the way that gases behave, let's assume that this is kind of the container our gases are in. If this is our gas molecule, it's going to move in a straight line until it hits the wall of a container. And it's going to bounce off and travel in a straight line again until it hits the walls. And it's just going to keep doing that as it continues to hit the walls of the container. It can also bounce off other gas particles, but it'll behave the same way, where it'll move in a straight line until it hits something, and then it'll kind of bounce off in the other direction. Um, these collisions are what's called inelastic collisions, meaning that there's no energy that's being lost in the collisions. They just kind of bounce off and continue on their merry way. Kind of like a game of pool, right? If you hit the cue ball, you know, and you're going to hit, I don't know, the green ball, um, you, you will transfer the energy to that one and they'll kind of bounce off each other. When we think about gases, we are going to talk a lot about collisions. Okay, collisions are going to lead to pressure. So essentially the way this plays out is the more collisions we have, the higher the pressure will be. So when I'm talking about this gas hitting the walls of the container, that's contributing to the pressure of the gas. And we'll talk more about that as we move forward. 
Um, like I've mentioned before, these gas molecules do not exhibit any intermolecular forces. That was one of the reasons that it took so much energy to go from a liquid state to a gas state. We had to input a ton of energy to completely break those intermolecular forces and allow those molecules to go into the gas phase. We're gonna talk about the energy of these gas molecules. And specifically, we're going to talk about them in terms of kinetic energy. If you're not familiar with the term kinetic energy, that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So when we're talking about the kinetic energy of a gas, that's going to be directly related to how fast or slow this molecule is moving. Okay, so it says here that the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule in a sample is proportional to the absolute temperature of that sample. So essentially, as we increase the temperature, that means our gas molecules will have more kinetic energy, which means they will be moving faster. So gas molecules move faster at higher temperatures. Okay, so all of these uh, different pieces of kinetic molecular theory that we just learned, we are going to relate these to ideal gases. Okay, um, and I wanna be clear. So ideal gases, this means they're not real. So in an ideal world, the gases would follow all of these behaviors. In reality, they don't quite, but these assumptions for kinetic molecular theory fit them pretty well, and it allows us to simplify the math a lot. If you go on in chemistry, you're going to learn some fancy equations for how to take these subtle discrepancies into account, but for this class, and actually for most times that we deal with gases, these assumptions for kinetic molecular theory are good enough for our calculations. So let's talk about some general properties of gases. Um, gases just in general are very different from liquids and solids. So gases have what's called an indefinite volume, which means we really don't measure volume of gases per se, uh, unless we've specified some of the other conditions because gases will expand to fill whatever container they're in. So if you put gases in a really small container, let's say a water bottle, they'll expand and they'll fill that container. But if you put them in a bigger container, say your bedroom, they'll expand and fill that container or a classroom or whatever it is. But the gases are always going to expand to fill a container. So that's why we say they have indefinite volume. They also have indefinite shape. They'll take the shape of whatever container we put them in. This is similar to liquids. Remember, liquids also have indefinite shape. We can pour our liquid into a beaker or a graduated cylinder or an Erlenmeyer flask, and it'll take the shape of whatever container we put it in. The same is true of gases, except they're not limited to being right next to each other. They will expand to fill whatever container you put them in. Gases also have very low densities. So if you'll recall, when we were measuring densities in the previous chapter, we measured densities in grams per milliliter for liquids typically, or grams per centimeter cubed, usually for solids. But we don't use these for gases. Okay, gases are measured in grams per liter. The reason for this is that gases have a really low mass. So if we were to measure the amount of grams that were in one milliliter of a gas, we would come up with a really small number. So it makes more sense to, to report our numbers in grams per liter because that's kind of a more friendly number. So like the density of air is 1.2 grams per liter. So if we have an, you know, a liter of gas, so if you're not familiar with maybe what a liter might look like, picture a two liter of soda and then cut that in half. Right, and that would be a liter. So we would measure the mass of that volume of a gas and it would weigh 1.2 grams. Not very much. And again, that's because gases have really low densities. And like I said, we could compare this to water where we measure grams per milliliter and that would be for a liquid. So gases will measure density in grams per liter. Like I said before, gases are compressible because they're not very dense, which means they're particles are really, really far apart, so we're able to kind of squish them together, which makes them compressible. Um, and they also have very high velocities, which is kind of another term for speed. It's similar. It's not quite the same, but it's similar. Um, they have very high velocities and very high kinetic energies. All right, let's talk about pressure. We are going to talk about pressure a lot with respect to gases. 
Okay, and this is what I want you to remember about pressure. If you don't remember anything else about pressure, remember that. When gas particles strike the walls of the container, they exert pressure. So whenever we're talking about pressure, I want you to think how many collisions will there be? Will, will there be more collisions than there were previously or fewer collisions than there were? Okay, and that's how we're going to kind of compare pressure. Um, so for example, if we heat up our gas, that means we're giving it more energy. We are inputting energy. So if we heat up our gas, that's going to increase the temperature, which increases the kinetic energy, which makes those molecules move faster. If they're moving faster, then they're going to hit the walls of the container more frequently, which increases the pressure, okay? So I want you to go through that whole thought process. So a good question might be, okay, if I increase the temperature, what happens to the pressure? You would say, okay, an increase in temperature is going to relate to an increase in kinetic energy. That's going to make my gas particles move faster, which means they will hit the walls of the container more often, which leads to an increase in pressure. That whole train of thought would be your answer, right? Make sure to be really, really thorough when answering these types of questions. All right, so you may have heard of atmospheric pressure, okay? Atmospheric pressure is the total pressure exerted by gases in the atmosphere. So essentially what that means is you sitting there on your chair, on your couch, wherever you are, you have pressure that's kind of sitting on top of you, that's shown in this picture. All of us do, okay? The atmosphere is essentially sitting on top of you and exerting pressure kind of on your head, on your shoulders, right? Because there's um, oxygen in the air, there's nitrogen, there's carbon dioxide, there's all kinds of things. And those molecules are continually kind of bombarding you, even though you don't notice, and they're exerting pressure on you, okay? So due to that mass of all the atmospheric gases pushing down on our Earth's surface, that's where we get atmospheric pressure, okay? Kind of weird to think about, but it really is what's happening. So when we talk about atmospheric pressure, we're literally talking about the mass of all the gas molecules that is sitting on top of you. So as you go up, like let's say, okay, so we're down here at sea level. We're actually a little bit below sea level here in the valley, but um, let's say we're at sea level and we have a pressure then of one atmosphere sitting on top of us, okay? By definition, they say one atmosphere of pressure is at sea level. But let's imagine we were all really ambitious on a Saturday and we decided to climb this mountain, and now we're up here. So since we are higher up and kind of closer to space, there is less atmosphere sitting on top of us. Therefore, we have a decrease in the atmospheric pressure because there's literally not as much atmosphere sitting on top of you. So our atmospheric pressure is lower. So that's what we're seeing over here in this table as well. At sea level, you know, we're at zero kilometers and we have 760 millimeters of mercury, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but if you look, Los Angeles is a little bit higher than we are. And so they have less atmospheric pressure. Or at the top of the mountain, like Mount Whitney, that is much higher than we are here and a much uh, lower atmospheric pressure because, again, there's less atmosphere sitting on top of you. So like I've said before, we're going to measure pressure with respect to collisions. So there are tons of gas particles, even like in this balloon, right? Remember, atoms and molecules are really, 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 really small. That's what we were learning about when we talked about the mole, right? These particles are super small. So even a balloon like that has billions, billions of gas particles and all of those particles colliding with the walls of the container, that's where we get pressure because they're constantly pushing outward, okay? Pressure is technically defined as a force acting over a certain area, but that's not really applicable for us in chemistry. That's more of a physics definition. So again, we're going to think about the number of collisions as it relates to pressure. So one of the things pressure depends on is the number of gas particles. If we increase the number of gas molecules, then we're going to increase the number of collisions and our pressure will increase, okay? It's also related to temperature, like we talked about earlier. As we increase the temperature, those gases will move faster and faster and faster, which means we will get more collisions and therefore increase the pressure. It's also related to the volume that's occupied by that gas. 
you could think about, okay, let's say we put our gas molecules in something like this, right? And they're going to travel and they're going to hit the walls of the container, etc. Okay, but if I put them in a smaller container, same amount of gas particles, but I just squished them now into a smaller container. Well, you can imagine they're going to hit the walls of the container more frequently because the container is smaller. So let's talk about measuring pressure. We measure pressure using a barometer. So the original barometer was developed by Torricelli in 1643, and this is his experiment. So essentially he took a, a really long test tube of sorts. It was closed at one end, opened at the other, and he evacuated it, which means he took everything out of it, even air, right? So there's literally nothing in there, and he stuck it upside down in a container of mercury. Okay, so remember, there are gases that are pushing down on your head, and those same gases push down on this container of mercury. Well, when the, the gases push down on the container of mercury, they force it up into this glass tube. And so the height that it rose was 760 millimeters. Okay, so when we talk about atmospheric pressure, and we say the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, that's because our mercury rose up into the air 760 millimeters because of those gases that were pushing down on it. Okay, so one atmosphere of pressure is technically defined as exactly 760 millimeters of mercury. So this is an equality that we can use, and you guessed it, in conversions, right? So one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury because again one atmosphere of gases pushed down on the mercury and made it rise up in that tube to a height of 760 millimeters so it's also called 760 tor millimeters of mercury and tor are the same thing this is named for torcelli and i don't blame him if i discovered something I would name it after myself too. <laughs> so uh, 760 tor is the same as saying 760 millimeters of mercury. This here is showing that millimeters of mercury and tor are the same thing. Um, usually we will measure things in millimeters of mercury, tor, or atmospheres, but our SI unit for pressure is in kilopascals, okay? So one atmosphere of pressure is 101.325 kilopascals. So these are both equal, right? We have one atmosphere here and one atmosphere here. So essentially all of this stuff is equal to each other. So what I want you to remember is this. One atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 760 tor, because millimeters of mercury and tor are the same thing, um, which is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So all of those are equal to each other, which means we can use all of them in conversions. Here are some other units. Um, you may be familiar with PSI. That's one of them that we use in the United States, which again, is not used anywhere else um, because it's pounds per square inch. Nobody else really uses pounds and nobody really uses inches, just us. Um, so the most common ones though are atmospheres. We are going to use atmospheres the most in this class. We'll also often use kilopascals and millimeters of mercury and tor. Those are the ones that I really would like you to know. Uh, we really won't use inches of mercury because, again, we don't use inches in this class. Um, and we won't often use pascals. But if you look, pascals and kilopascals are related by that prefix of a thousand. Remember, kilo means one thousand. So there are thousand pascals in a kilopascal. All right, let's try this one out. We're going to convert 740 millimeters of mercury to atmospheres and then to kilopascals. So two different problems. First, we're going to convert it to atmospheres in part A and to kilopascals in part B. So our, our conversion to relate millimeters of mercury to atmospheres is that there is one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And just in case you're interested, this is exact. Um, that's by definition when he did that experiment. So one atmosphere is exactly 760 millimeters of mercury. So that 760 and that one are not limiting our significant figures. All right, so just like any time when we do conversions, we need to figure out what goes in the beginning of our train track. So that 740 millimeters of mercury will go in the beginning and we'll set it up. 
Remember, millimeters of mercury has to cancel millimeters of mercury down into the right. So that 760 will go on the bottom and one atmosphere will go on the top. Make sure our units cancel, multiply the top, divide the bottom, we'll get our answer. So again, we have three sig figs here because we had three sig figs in 740 millimeters of mercury. All right, so for the next one, we were converting millimeters of mercury to kilopascals. Our conversion here is that we have 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. Okay, um, when we were using that conversion on the previous page, so I'll write it up here. We had one ATM is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 760 tor, which is equal to 101. 0.3, it's actually 325 kilopascals, okay? So when we need to do these conversions, we can pick and choose the parts that we need to use. So for this one, it says we needed to get from millimeters of mercury to kilopascals. So I'll take millimeters of mercury and I'll take kilopascals and I'll set those bits equal to each other. Okay, so for these conversions, you can just pick and choose the parts that you need. You don't need to like convert from millimeters of mercury to tor to kilopascals. Like we don't need to do that. You're just going to pick the portions of this that you need because all of it is equal to all of the other things. So let's go ahead and try this. We're starting with 740 millimeters of mercury. And again, we need to cancel our units down and to the right. So millimeters of mercury cancels millimeters of mercury and kilopascals goes on the top. We'll make sure our units cancel, multiply the top, divide the bottom, and we'll get our answer. Alrighty, let's go ahead and get some practice. Pause here and complete problems number one through two on the chapter eight lecture worksheet. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, so we've already been talking about properties of gases, but now we're going to start modeling them mathematically. I know you're excited. <laughs> so uh, when we are modeling our gases mathematically, we need to have some variables. So anytime you see the capital letter V, that's going to stand for the volume of the gas, and we are going to want that to be in liters, okay? You can also use milliliters in some types of problems, but not in all types of problems. So if you want to be on the safe side, I would just always convert to liters, just in case you're going to forget. And then our temperature is going to be represented by the letter T, and your temperature always must be in Kelvin. Do you see in bold letters, I put all temperatures, and the entire chapter must be in Kelvins. No, except, like, really. You cannot do any of these calculations in Celsius, and definitely not in Fahrenheit. Um, the math does not work unless your temperature's in Kelvin. So always, always, always must be in Kelvin. Um, if you see N, N stands for the amount of something. And in this case, it's going to stand for the number of moles. And then P is pressure. Typically, we are going to measure our pressure in atmospheres, which is abbreviated ATM. Um, but in some types of problems, you can use kilopascals or tor or millimeters of mercury. Just there are some types of problems where you can only use atmospheres. So again, if you want to be on the safe side, just always use atmospheres and you won't have to worry about it. Like we talked about before, pressure depends on the number of molecules of our gas. So if we increase our number of moles, then we are going to increase the number of collisions, right? Simply because there's more stuff in there, right? If you think about, let's say our classroom had 30 people um, and we were all walking around, Okay, well now let's think about if we had, I don't know, 100 people, right? More people is going to equal more collisions. It's the same thing with our gas molecules. If we have more gas molecules, we are going to have more collisions, both with other gas molecules and with the sides of the container. So more collisions, more pressure. Our first gas law that we're going to talk about is Boyle's Law. So that's this guy. His name is Robert Boyle. He was the son of an Earl of Cork in Ireland, which is pretty cool. Um, but he stated that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So by inversely proportional, what I mean is that if, you know, volume goes up, pressure goes down. If volume goes down, pressure goes up, right? They're always going to be 
opposites, essentially. That's what inversely proportional means. And so this relationship is true if the moles and the temperature remain constant. So we're not changing the number of our gas particles. We're not messing with the temperature. All we're doing is changing the pressure or changing the volume and seeing how the other variable reacts. Okay, so our equation here is P1V1 equals P2V2. Okay, so this equation, this is Boyle's Law. So a, a bicycle pump is a really good example of Boyle's Law. So again, Boyle's Law is pressure and volume are inversely proportional. If I was to push down on my bicycle pump, right, to pump air in, I push down, that decreases the volume. Do you see from here to here? We have decreased the volume. When I decrease the volume, that means that the molecules have kind of less space to move around and they're going to hit the walls of the container more frequently. If they're hitting the walls of the container more frequently, that means we are going to see an increase in pressure. So from here to here, do you see our volume went down and our pressure went up? They are inversely proportional. So as we, like if we think about the bicycle pump and we, you know, kind of pull this up and then push it down, we are, you know, decreasing the volume, which increases the pressure in here and then forces the gas into the tire. So again, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Let's do an example problem. So this says, what volume will a 3.5 liters of a gas occupy if the pressure is changed from 730 millimeters of mercury to 600 millimeters of mercury. All right, let's go ahead and solve this. So this, do you see we have two different pressures? That's showing us that our pressure is changing. We only have one volume, but we're trying to find the other. So that means that this is a Boyle's Law problem, okay? We're trying to figure out the relationship between pressure and volume. So I always like to start with writing down what I know. I know my initial volume, which is V1, my initial pressure, and my final pressure. So I'm trying to find V2, okay? So I'll usually put something like, you know, what is the volume? All right, so we would rearrange this to solve for V2. In order to solve these problems, you always need to have the variable that you're looking for by itself. So if we take this problem, right, we have P1V1 equals P2V2. To get V2 by itself, we need to divide by what's next to it. So we need to get rid of P2 on that side. And the way that we do that, we just divide. So P2 is gone and V2 is by itself. So that's what we're seeing here. I've just flipped the equation around because I like to have the variable that I'm solving for on the left-hand side. But you're welcome to leave it you know, this way that I've shown up here with V2 on the right-hand side. Doesn't matter, won't impact your calculations either way. All right, so now that we have V2 by itself, we can go ahead and plug things in. For these types of problems, you don't need to have your pressures in atmospheres. Like I said, for later problems in this chapter, we are going to come across problems where we have to have it in atmospheres. So if you'd like to practice doing that conversion here and just kind of getting in the habit, you totally can. Your answer will come out exactly the same, no matter if you leave it in millimeters of mercury or if you convert it to atmospheres. All right, so let's go ahead and plug things in. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this in millimeters of mercury, but like I said, if you convert it to atmospheres, you'll get the same answer. So we have P1 and V1 over P2. When we multiply those together, we'll get our answer. So this makes sense. If you look, do you see that we are decreasing the pressure from here to here? We are decreasing the pressure, therefore we would expect our volume to increase which it did, it went from 3.5 liters to 4.3 liters. Because remember, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So that's a good check um, if you're not sure if your answer is right or if you've set up the problem correctly. All right, your turn. This says a sample of neon gas occupies 250 milliliters at 880 torr. Calculate the pressure of neon, right? So calculate the new pressure, essentially, if the volume is increased to one liter, assuming constant temperature, okay? So do you notice here that we have milliliters for one and liters for the other? You're going to need to make sure that those are both the same. 
For this type of problem, they don't need to both be in liters. They could actually both be in milliliters and that would be okay. But like I said, in later problems in this chapter, both volumes would need to be in liters. So if you wanna practice doing that conversion now, you can, but you just need your units to match. So the issue with this problem starting off is that our units are different. So what I would do is convert your milliliters to liters before trying to solve this problem. So go ahead, pause here, try this problem out, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, so we know this is a Boyle's Law problem because we have pressure and volume. So first thing like I like to do is figure out everything I know. So it says for calculate the pressure of neon. This will be our P2. So we're trying to find P2, so I like to put P2 question mark. I should know then all of my other variables. So I know my initial volume, that's 250 milliliters. So what you're gonna wanna do is convert 250 milliliters to liters. So we could do 250 milliliters. We know there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So essentially we divide this by 1,000. So that's how we got this. We converted milliliters to liters. We know our second volume is one liter and our pressure is 880 torr. Um, it's fine, you'll notice actually, um, I put millimeters of mercury. Remember, millimeters of mercury and torr are the same thing. My apologies. So I'll go ahead and put torr here, but they are the same thing. Um, but you could have left this, or you could have converted this to atmospheres as well. It doesn't matter, um, just as long as, like I said, your units match. All right, so now we're trying to solve for P2. So we need to rearrange our equation to get P2 by itself. P1 V1 equals P2 V2. In order to get P2 by itself, we need to divide both sides by V2. So when we do that, now P2 is by itself on that side, and we get P1 V1 uh, divided by V2 equals P2. So there it is. Again, I flipped it around so that P2 is by itself. All right, now we can go ahead and plug things in. Okay, so we'll make sure our units cancel, and then we'll multiply the top, divide the bottom, and we'll get our answer. And yeah, like I said, if you had got this in uh, atmospheres, you can just divide my answer here by 760, and that will get you your answer in atmospheres. Since I didn't specify in this problem if I wanted my answer in atmospheres or millimeters of mercury, I just said pressure. You're welcome to give it to me in either unit. All right, here's another one. A sample of gaseous nitrogen in a 65 liter automobile airbag has a pressure of 745 millimeters of mercury. If the sample is transferred to a 25 liter bag at the same temperature, what is the pressure in the bag? Go ahead and pause here and try this out and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. Alrighty, let's go over this. So again, we're solving for P2, just like we did before. So we'll divide both sides by V2 to get P2 by itself. And then we can plug in everything that we know, okay? So if we look at this, our P1 is 745 millimeters of mercury. Our V1 is 65 liters, and our V2 is 25 liters. Okay, so we can go ahead and plug all of those in. and. Uh, my apologies, it says tor, and it should be millimeters of mercury, but again, I kind of use them interchangeably. They are the same thing. So we have P1, V1 over V2, and we'll get our answer. Again, we could do a common sense check here. Do you see that our volume is decreasing from 65 to 25? So if our volume is decreasing, that means our pressure should increase. And as you can see, our pressure increased a lot. All right, I want you to get some work on the Boyle's Law problems. So go ahead and pause here and complete problems number three through seven on the chapter eight lecture worksheet. And then come back when you're ready to keep going. All right, so we've already talked about temperature quite a bit um, thus far, we talked about as we increase temperature, that means our motion of our molecules will increase, 
right? And that usually means that they're moving faster, which means they're going to hit the sides of the container more frequently, which means we're going to see an increase in collisions, which means an increase in pressure. All right, all of that. That's what we've talked about temperature so far. Remember, I said that your temperature must be in Kelvin, okay? The Kelvin temperature scale is actually derived from the relationship between temperature and volume of a gas. So we definitely need to be in Kelvin when we're talking about gases. Um, like I said before, all gases are expected to have zero volume if cooled to negative 273 degrees Celsius. And negative 273 degrees Celsius, that would be zero Kelvin. And again, we're saying that's where the motion of all molecules stops. So if you think about it, right, if the motion of our molecules stops, that means our gases are no longer hitting the walls of the container, which means we don't have any pressure, so we don't have any volume. But again, this is theoretical. Physicists have not yet reached zero Kelvin, so we still don't know what happens when we get there, but they're pretty close, so they have a really good idea. So again, just in general, we need to have all of our temperature in Kelvin for this entire chapter. So here is your equation. Our temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273 will give us our temperature in Kelvin. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about how temperature relates to volume. So when temperature relates to volume, this is called Charles' Law. So Charles' Law um, was created by Jacques Charles um, he is actually really well known for isolating boron, which is pretty cool. Um, but he also studied gases because he was a balloonist. I think that sounds like a really cool job. <laughs> um, but anyways, his um, law is that the pressure, or sorry, the volume of a gas and its temperature are directly proportional. So as long as we keep the pressure constant, the number of moles constant, then the temperature and the volume of a gas are directly proportional. Directly proportional means if one goes up, the other one goes up. So for example, if we increase temperature, that means our motion of our molecules is increasing. That means our collisions will increase, which means our, our volume will expand if it's able to, okay? Because of that increase of pressure on the inside. So an increase in pressure means an increase in volume. So this is what this slide is showing. So as we increase our temperature, so like from here to here, do you see the flame got bigger? We have increased our temperature. As we increase our temperature, our molecules begin to move faster because they have more kinetic energy. So as they move faster, that means they will have more collisions with the walls of the container. More collisions equals more pressure. But in order to keep the pressure constant, this container actually can expand. And so it'll expand and expand and expand until it reaches, again, that constant pressure. So that means our volume will increase. So an increase in temperature leads to an increase in volume. So an example of this, uh, two of them, one is, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, it's actually happened to me. Um, if you have, let's say, um, a 12 pack of soda in your car. This is exactly what happened to me. Um, and it's hot in the summertime in the valley, right? What happens is those cans of soda are under a great deal of pressure. Like if you notice when you open a soda can, it goes, tss, right? That's, that's releasing the pressure that's in that soda can. All that pressure was keeping that carbon dioxide dissolved in your soda, okay? Um, there's a tiny bit of room above your liquid between you know the liquid and the can there's a tiny bit of room there and it's filled with gases well as they sit in your hot car your gases gain kinetic energy because they are increasing temperature so those gases move faster and faster and faster and um, as they move faster they are going to increase the number of collisions which increases the pressure and when they increase the pressure it wants to increase the volume the way it increases the volume is by exploding your soda cans. I had a 12 pack of Diet Pepsi explode in the back of my car um, and it took a long time to get it out. So that is one example of Charles Law. Uh, another example of Charles Law is if you um, do this example, it's, it's actually really cool. This is liquid nitrogen they, what they have. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen liquid nitrogen before. It's really cool. It's very, 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 very cold liquid. 
And if you pour liquid nitrogen on a balloon, you can actually get it to collapse like this. The reason for this is liquid nitrogen, I believe is at about negative 78 degrees Celsius. So it's pretty cold. And when you pour it on um, your balloon that's at room temperature, it immediately cools all of those gas molecules down. So they move slower and slower and slower. As they move slower, they have fewer collisions, which means a decrease in pressure, which decreases the volume. All right, let's do an example of this type of calculation. So here's our Charles law right there. Volume and temperature are directly proportional. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So let's say we had three liters of hydrogen gas at negative 15 degrees Celsius, and we warm it up to 27 degrees Celsius. And I wanna know what's the gas volume at 27 degrees Celsius. So since this is relating volume and temperature, this is a Charles law problem. So if you'll recall, we cannot have our temperatures in Celsius. So the second you see these temperatures in Celsius, you need to convert them to Kelvin. So for both of these, we are going to add 273 in order to convert it to Kelvin. So that's what you're seeing here. We converted both temperatures to Kelvin. Um, our volume is totally fine to be left in liters, and we are solving for the new volume. So we're solving for V2. So in order to solve for V2, I know it's a little bit um, tricky. People don't like fractions, so let's talk about this. So we're solving for V2, so we need to get V2 by itself. So what we do is we can multiply both sides by T2 because T2 is in the denominator. So when we do that, that gets rid of this, and that leaves V2 by itself on that side. So we get T2 and V1 on the top and T1 on the bottom. When they get multiplied by this, you can think about it as being multiplied by over 1. That T2 goes on the top. Okay, so we get V2 equals V1 T2 over T1. Okay, so now if we plug things in, we'll get our answer in liters. All right, let's go ahead and do another one. This says a gas has a volume of three liters at 10 degrees Celsius. What is the temperature of the gas if it expands to six liters, assuming constant pressure? So the assuming constant pressure is just telling us that we can use Charles law to solve this problem. All right, so again, we have two volumes and a temperature, and it's asking for another temperature. So this is a Charles law problem. So first thing we wanna do is kind of lay out all our variables. Again, as soon as you see Celsius, you need to think, all right, I need to convert that to Kelvin. I'm going to add 273. So now we have V1, T1, V2, and we are solving for T2. Do you see that T2 is in the denominator? That's usually pretty tough to solve for. Um, and it really throws people for a loop. What I recommend, anytime you're going to solve for anything in the de denominator like that, is you start off by cross multiplying. And what I mean by that is we're gonna multiply T2 up there and T1 up there. So we're going to cross multiply. So what that gives us is V1 T2 because the T2 got multiplied up there. And then we get V2 T1 because the T1 got multiplied by up there. So that actually gets rid of the fraction compo component for now and gets that T2 that we're looking for out of the denominator because we can't solve for a variable in the denominator. All right, so now that T2 is out of the denominator, we can get it by itself. So here's T2. So we divide both sides by V1 to get T2 by itself. So now T2 is isolated and we have our equation. So there it is. T2 is equal to T1 V2 over V1. You'll notice that in my equation down below, these two are switched. Doesn't matter at all. As long as they both end up on the top, totally fine. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and plug things in now and we'll get our answer. All righty, I want you to try this one. This one says at 321 Kelvin, a gas occupies 635 milliliters of volume. If the temperature is decreased to 216 Kelvin, what is the new gas volume? Okay, so go ahead, pause here, try this one out, and then come back when you're ready to see the answer. All 
Alrighty. So we are solving for V2, okay? Because it says, what is the new gas volume? So that says, okay, what is V2? If we look through here, we're given T1, which is already in Kelvin, that's awesome, and V1 and T2, okay? So we're just looking for V2. So we can plug everything into our problem here and multiply it up. And again, we can do a logic check. Do you see that the temperature is decreasing? It's going from 321 Kelvin to 216 Kelvin. So we're decreasing our temperature. And remember, temperature and volume are directly proportional, which means they do the same thing. If our temperature goes down, that means our volume goes down, which it did here. It went from 635 milliliters to 427 milliliters. All right, let's get some practice on Charles' Law. Go ahead and pause here and complete problems number 8 through 12 on the Chapter 8 Lecture Worksheet. Once you're done, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, so like we've talked about a little bit before, pressure also depends on temperature. Remember, we're always going to talk about pressure with respect to collisions. So like we said before, if we increase our temperature, we're going to increase the motion of the molecules, which leads to more collisions, which is going to lead to an increase in pressure. So it makes sense that pressure is dependent on temperature. Okay, so um, if you see here, we're changing our temperature from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. So we are increasing the temperature, which makes those molecules move faster, and then they move faster, they'll have more collisions, which increases the pressure. So if you see from here to here, our pressure has increased. So this is represented by Gay-Lussac's Law. So Gay-Lussac's Law says if the number of moles and volume are constant, then pressure and temperature are directly proportional. So again, directly proportional means if one thing goes up, then the other thing goes up, right? If temperature goes up, then we're going to see more, you know, faster molecules, more collisions, therefore more pressure. So our equation here is represented by P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So pressure and temperature are directly proportional. So here's an example. If we increase the temperature, right? Again, if we increase the temperature, our molecules are moving faster, which means there will be more collisions, which means we will have an increase in pressure. Um, this is assuming that our you know, container here can't change. We're not changing the number of moles and we're not changing the volume of our container. So if the volume of our container is locked in place, then that pressure will continue to build up as those molecules move faster. Again, make sure though our temperature is always in Kelvin. Super, super important. Alrighty, to practice this law, go ahead and complete problems number 13 to 14 on the chapter eight lecture worksheet. They are very similar to the problems that we are just doing for Charles' Law. The only difference here is that you're using pressure and temperature instead of volume and temperature. So go ahead and get some problems on those. This actually wraps up our first lecture of chapter eight. We covered a lot of ground today. We talked about kind of general properties of gases with volume and pressure and temperature, and especially learning about those um, assumptions that we make in kinetic molecular theory that allow us to predict the behavior of gases and do some calculations using these simple gas laws. Today, we covered Boyle's law, Charles' law, and Gay-Lussac's law, and we learned how to mathematically model the behavior of gases. Within that, we also learned how to do some pressure conversions, and we learned that temperature must always be in Kelvin anytime we are doing gas law problems. Okay. Next time, we're going to learn about more gas law equations. So make sure you feel really solid with the types of calculations that we learned how to do today and that you are really, really good at doing pressure conversions, volume conversions like milliliters to liters, and temperature conversions because they are going to be really useful as we move into the next lecture. So get lots of practice on these types of problems. And as always, if you have any questions, you know, First, check the lecture worksheet and see if you can work them out. But if you can't, please feel free to send me a message 
or stop by my office hours and ask me questions. I like talking about gases. I think they're really interesting and I'm more than happy to help you out. Um, otherwise, keep doing lots of practice problems and I will talk to you guys next time.